Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Anthony Hardy, who is a Gulf War and Somalia veteran and has been committed to work uh, on veterans' policy issues and especially uh, veterans' health concerns for a long time. He serves on several federal and state advisory panels focusing on Gulf War illness, uh, is the author of a Gulf War health and news website, and has provided testimony and served as a resource to Congress on Gulf War issues. He's been a congressional aide and uh, serves now as well on the RAC committee, on the uh, Research Advisory Committee, and was involved in the Department of Defense's medical research program. It's a pleasure and an honor to have Mr. Anthony Hardy share some thoughts with us. And then we'll have questions and answers after. Well, first, I would just want to thank everyone for uh, for being here, and especially to um, uh, Dr. Anas for hosting this uh, exceptional conference. Um, uh, Dr. White, uh, Bobby, just can't thank you and all of your colleagues, uh, Kim Sullivan and others, enough for everything that you do and have done and still continue to, uh, to do as well. Um, uh, Dr. Grodin, uh, Professor Glantz, Professor Mariner, uh, thank you all uh, very much as well. And I'd hope that um, uh, Dr. Cassells would still be here, but I'll just thank him uh, uh, just for his work as well that, um, you know, I, I really appreciated the question that came up a little while ago about uh, the Department of Defense, I'm sorry, the, the VA and how we sort of justify the, uh, this wonderful reputation that VA has in some circles and some quarters with uh, uh, the challenges that have been experienced by veterans. And uh, I think the VA is very good uh, in lots of areas. I deal myself with, besides Gulf War illness issues and certain chemical exposures and a host of other is uh, medical issues related to my service in the, in the Gulf, orthopedic and so on. Uh, also deal with PTSD from Somalia, uh, which is another confounding uh, factor. Um, and I, I can't imagine going any place else besides VA for something like PTSD, where they're phenomenal with their care at PTSD today, but they certainly were not when I came home from the Gulf, let alone you know even even 10 or 15 years ago. So the VA has come a long ways, and it's certainly good in some areas, uh, many areas, um, uh, but still with uh, treatment for multi-system, uh, multi-symptom illness, and multi-system illness. Uh, there's a long ways to go, and that's not just VA's fault. We veterans learned a long time ago that the problems lay in Washington, uh, not in, uh, uh, not at our, with our, our doctors uh, on the front lines at the VA medical centers. Um, also, to my brother in arms, Paul Sullivan. Well, first of all, just thank you for everything that you have done and that you continue to do. Um, we go for veterans would not be where we were, uh, where we are today, if it weren't for you and for a handful of other people who have really stuck with the fight for all these years, and, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about who are Gulf War veterans. We've heard Paul's definition, which is a, a very important definition for the Gulf War extending through 20 years for being able to get benefits. One of the things that we learned from Vietnam veterans before us was never again shall one generation of veterans abandon another. And so we've uh, very much tried to look forward as well. And so that's the kind of advocacy that Paul is talking about. Today, I'm only talking about Gulf War veterans from 1990 to 1991. We served in this, uh, this is a map of the, the ground campaign. You can sort of see where the British flag is uh, off to the, uh, to the right of the picture. Uh, that's Kuwait. And then uh, this multinational campaign with uh, the multinational forces uh, you can see on the, along the coast, Joint Forces Command East, that's who I was located with, in between uh, the two multinational coalitions uh, divisions was the Marine Central Command, which went up um, um, through the uh, th through Kuwait and then uh, British, American, French, and so on divisions off, uh, off to the west as well that sort of swooped in and then came in uh, over, over the top. But it gives you sort of a sense of uh, uh, where we were. These are some of the numbers. Now this is coming from uh, 2007 numbers. Um, Paul has been working diligently with the Gulf War Veterans Information System report that he helped to create at VA that helps to provide all of this data. Uh, it's a source of frustration and anxiety for uh, angst for many of us Gulf War veterans, the fact that it is, has disappeared. VA has delayed uh, and, and deferred, and we're hoping that they're going to be releasing uh, the report this coming week in time for the RAC report. Uh, there's an article on uh, my website about it, 91 outcomes from another Gulf War veterans advocate, Kurt 
uh, love, who's been doing a lot of advocacy. But what we're really talking about here out of all these numbers are, is the yellow one. We're talking about 697,000 uh, of us who served in the, uh, in the Gulf War conflict from 1990 to 1991. You can see that the age was a little bit older than uh, the average age in Vietnam was 19. In the Gulf War, it was 27, perhaps because that there were so many who were Reserve and Guard members uh, as well, um, with the first major call-up of the Reserve and Guards after Vietnam. Um, the force was 70% white, 23% African American. Uh, African Americans were highly overrepresented uh, in the military and in the Gulf. Um, the Army um, uh, had 50% and the Marine Corps 15% as well. Navy and Air Force were primarily not uh, in the areas where, uh, where, us, uh, uh, where we ground troops were. And as you can see as well, primarily male, only 7% female. Uh, that's caused some study challenges uh, at, as well for ha and having to oversample. Uh, to put things into perspective, the latest numbers that I'd heard, and Paul will correct me if I'm wrong, but about 15% of the current force uh, are women. Is that about right? So more than double where we were in 19, uh, uh, 1991. Um, I'm just one Gulf War veteran out of 250,000, but I have a voice and I've been able to be able to use it. And so I'm going to just share a little bit about my personal story, just to give a sense of what is like, what has been like as one of the 250,000 of us that uh, the IOM has identified now as being these folks with chronic Gulf War illness. Um, on January 17th of 1991, much of America watched Operation Desert Storm unfold on the evening news. And, uh, but for many of the nearly 700,000 troops who served, our overarching Gulf War experience had only just begun. And for some of us who uh, developed lasting health effects from the toxic soup of hazardous exposures that came while we were still in the Gulf, like for me. For others, it didn't come until sometime after coming home and realizing that things were, they just couldn't do the same kinds of level of activity that they could do before, or they were having uh, lots of issues. Hearing the long list of hazardous exposures and issues uh, so eloquently uh, covered by Dr. Bobby White, again, one of our leading champions, I think most people would find it no surprise that so many thousands of Gulf War veterans became ill or that so many remain ill and injured today. But what's stunning and surprising is that it's now been nearly 20 years and there's still very few tangible results that might improve the health of those who became ill and remain ill, not because of people like Bobby White, but, but in spite of people like Bobby White. Years were squandered disputing, as we've been hearing, whether Gulf War veterans were really ill studying stress, reporting that what was wrong with Gulf War vests was the same as after every war, and an incredible amount of time and effort was put into disproving the claims of countless veterans providing sworn testimony before Congress. Sadly, while, lessen, while much of that is lessening, there still seems to be some of that negative effect even today within some powerful quarters, uh, within, uh, uh, particularly within uh, uh, the DOD. VA seems to be changing at this point, but we still have uh, some significant issues within um, one quarter in the Department of Defense. And so because, for those reasons, I've allowed my own health and personal privacy to become public, and not just because I'm one of those 250,000 veterans affected by Gulf War illnesses, but to be the voice for so many whose other voices otherwise would go unheard. Um, my, again, my experiences are far from unique, and to put things into perspective, in 1991, I was a young, fit, 22-year-old special operations soldier tasked to the multinational coalition forces in the, when the war began, and I turned age 23 in February, just days before we moved across the border into Kuwait. In mid-January of 1991, my team of about 30 men stationed with um, uh, the multinational forces, we were a very small group of Americans as a liaison team with the multinational forces, uh, commanded by the, uh, 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 the Saudis. Uh, my team of about 30 men was be, uh, directed to begin taking the PB uh, nerve agent protective pills we'd all been issued. And each of us had to verify that the next person down was taking the, uh, the pills. We had to physically observe that the pill was put into the mouth, swallowed, open your mouth, make sure it's gone. Uh, it was a force protection me measure. I've heard from Gulf War veterans that many were required to take it, some were not. Some had different experiences, but in, in my particular group, uh, we all were ordered to take it. We were told at the time they were experimental. We were told at the time they were not FDA approved, that we had no choice in consenting, and that uh, we would probably experience symptoms that was, would be similar to mild nerve agent poisoning the entire time that we'd be taking them, including things like watery eyes, runny nose, confusion, dizziness, muscle twitching, diarrhea, weight loss, and generally feeling quite ill. 
that was held true for about two thirds of us. Um, uh, and we took the pills for quite a number of, uh, number of weeks. Today, science has shown uh, largely through the efforts of Dr. White and others, the ill effects of this ill-conceived experiment in uninformed non-consent. And I really appreciate, uh, Dr. Anas, your work on bioethics and uh, informed consent as well. And I've been uh, uh, picked up a couple of your books and had hoped to read them before I got here. That just didn't quite happen. But I do promise that I will read them. And I'm, I'm fascinated by your work and uh, uh, pioneering efforts that, uh, you know, this, this was something that, uh, uh, in my mind as a soldier, should, should never ever have been allowed to, to happen with uninformed, uh, with no consent and with uh, not being informed. Um, I have a little bit different perspective than some others. Uh, you know, after uh, 19 years to reflect on this, almost 20 years, um, my sense is that a lot of what happened with the Gulf, uh, I call it the fog of war. And we've all heard of the fog of war in previous wars, but the, the, war, the war in 1991 was this technologically vaunted war that we were able to watch live, or, or folks here in the States were able to watch live on CNN, and everything just seemed to be just so precise and so perfect, and that was the psychological image that the military was trying to portray, and I, I know I worked in psychological operations, and that was part of what we tried to, uh, tried to portray. And, um, that's not accurate. On the ground, it was very much a different story. There was very much a fog of war. For example, when the first Scud missiles were fired by Iraq, uh, ground troops near the border, like uh, near the Kuwait and uh, Iraqi border, like me, well, we were concerned about them hitting our locations because, well, the Iraqi political military strategy had, was not yet understood by anyone. When more than 700 of Kuwait's oil well fires were lit on fire, Islamic and non-Islamic forces alike, well, we just quietly were discussing whether the midnight darkness at noon was some sort of cataclysm, whether it was the end days. There was no possible explanation for that it was darker than nighttime, at, darker than a cloudless night. I'm sorry, darker than a very cloudy night with no moon at noon. We had no frame of reference. And so there was, and there was no information coming from higher command either of what was going on, the fog of war uh, again. When chemical alarms sounded or silkworm missiles came in, in my opinion, a denial cycle between forward and theater level commands led to a widespread belief that the tens of thousands of alarms, as what we learned later was the, was the, was the count, um, some of those even double and triple verified as accurate chemical alarms were simply faulty. During the war, my team's chemical alarms went off a number of times. Like most other Gulf War troops, we were told the Iraqis had not used or even forward deployed their chemical weapons. Therefore, the alarms must have been sand or some other false alarms because simple logic showed that it couldn't possibly be chemicals and therefore there had, must be some flaw in the system. In one instance, a nearby Marine Corps unit uh, reported having been attacked with chemical warfare agents. Then another report came in, confirmation of that attack by a British unit. While the story was hushed up quickly, Gulf War veterans after the war have testified that these kinds of in incidents were numerous and frequent across the entire theater of operations. In my case, on one uh, night, an, a land-to-sea silkworm missile um, sounding like a train overhead killed about a dozen Senegalese troops from a, a position that we had just left. On another night, we were the target of a multi-volley Iraqi artillery raid, and given the unexplained severe painful rash all over all the exposed skin on my face and hands, on one of those nights as I'd slept under the only open window in the building, I've often uh, and long wondered about the causes and the effects. Uh, when we moved into Kuwait City and occupied the former Iraqi command center for the occupation of Kuwait, uh, not far from the Kuwaiti International Airport, all of us troops regaled the room-sized sand table map of Kuwait, covered with chemical warfare and other symbols of chemical warfare, uh, where chemical warfare agents were positioned. The next day, officers from the Central Command in Riyadh flew in, and the facility was closed off permanently for the remaining two months that we were stationed in a building right almost next door. We troops were ordered to hand over or destroy any film we might have of it. Almost immediately after the war's end, three of us went through one particular Iraqi bunker complex north of the Kuwait Bay. I was struck going through these bunkers by a couple of things. First, that the Iraqis had left almost everything behind including un un uh, half-eaten food on plates, something that struck me as being very strange because soldiers never know when they might be able to eat again. And if you're moving out, you're going to find some way to scramble down those last few bites. And it wasn't just one or two plates. It was throughout the, throughout the complex. Equipment, gear, personal gear left behind. 
Um, we found no documents, which is what we were looking for, but uh, all sorts of gear. And what I was also struck by was this lovely fragrance um, that filled all of the bunkers and uh, smelled like these large red flowers that filled my grandmother's garden back home in Wisconsin. And I couldn't remember what the name of them was. And I thought, well, that was odd because, you know, I, I grew up around these flowers and didn't realize that I was dealing with confusion and uh, some other issues and, and, and so on. The, the, um, along with this lovely captivating fragrance of geraniums uh, was the pervasive odor that I thought smelled like wet onions. And I found that to also to be very odd because in some of the bunkers, they were completely empty, yet the odor was still there as well. In fact, I even made it a point to look around trying to find where this smell of wet onions was coming from, not realizing that geraniums, um, well, if I, I should add, I, if I'd been looking at my watch, I could have told you shortly thereafter what the date and time were when my severe chronic cough began that has never subsided. Like many Gulf War veterans and Iranian veterans from the Iran-Iraq War preceded us from the 1981 to 1988 Iran-Iraq War, uh, that cough has never subsided. And for years, I believed that my black sputum that I coughed up for three months along with lung tissue uh, and the never-ending cough that continued was the result of oil well fire smoke. Years later, being a typically, well un, typically untrained uh, Gulf War troop, I was horrified to learn that the smells from that bunker complex that day are the characteristic odors of lewisite, which smells like geraniums, and mustard, which smells like onions or garlic. It's a classic mixture used heavily by the Iraqis during the Iran-Iraq War. Even still, I discounted my severe respiratory illness because uh, I didn't have any skin blisters, not realizing that until years later, reading Iran, research from uh, the cohort of Iran troops that uh, about 80% of those exposed to mustard during the Iran-Iraq war had blisters, but about 93% had lung injuries. In other words, you're far more likely, uh, while you are likely to have skin blisters, you're far more likely to have, uh, the, the most significant and most likely effect you'll have is uh, respiratory issues. Um, mustard and lewisite, I also learned later, are heavier than air, which makes sense why that we didn't smell any of these odors above ground. Uh, it was the only below ground, uh, and it was in the lowest, uh, and hanging in the lowest areas where they can be persistent for quite a long, uh, quite a long time. Um, I had a host of other exposures. Uh, after having a, a terrible respiratory illness that um, uh, was concerned enough that I thought I, I, I might actually be dying, um, uh, had um, uh, finally began to get better, and uh, medical treatment consisted of just the, the unit medic um, looking and saying, well, you just got a really bad cold and, you know, and cough it up. So I would lay on the end of my cot and cough up, uh, uh, you know, small chunks of black sputum and, and what appeared to me to be tissue uh, as well. And um, I've heard enough first-hand accounts from Gulf War ground troops from coming across chemical mines, being hit with isolated chemical attacks, and more that today, uh, after 19 years, I firmly believe that the CIA and the DOD had no basis for their long-held public statements that Iraqi ground commanders never possessed or used chemical weapons during the war. In fact, the extent and impact of intelligence failures was widely discussed on and off the battlefield during that war, in which I believe there was very much a fog of war. And if there's, um, uh, as I've testified before Congress, um, certainly there's, there's more information that could be pr provided. Um, coming home, and I'm gonna cover this very briefly, but coming home, I uh, went back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and went into my medical clinic hoping to get care. Uh, overheard the, the medics talking in the hallway. This is another one of those Gulf War veterans who thinks he's sick. Being a, a typical special operations soldier, I just vowed to never go back to the clinic again for my lung issues and that I would simply deal with them. Uh, I was uh, diagnosed with asthma, uh, not by any testing, but simply because I had a cough, was given, a, uh, given an asthma inhaler, and there were a few of us, uh, not all of us, but there were a handful of us that had uh, similar experiences and decided to wait till I got to the VA, which I thought would be just a magical cure when I left the military um, uh, after I deployed to Somalia later on and so on. That certainly was not, uh, was not the case. And in fact, uh, at one point, um, another uh, Gulf War veteran act, uh, advocate and former president of the National Gulf War Research Center, Chris Kornkovin, also from Wisconsin, he and I traveled together to the VA to advocate on behalf of all of our fellow Gulf War veterans and were told by the newly designated uh, Gulf War veteran patient coordinator who is an environmental health specialist 
there's nothing wrong with you guys. It's all in your heads. You just need to forget about, forget about it, get on with your lives, and get past it. And uh, obviously, it didn't take much more from there to realize that we had a, a, a pretty big battle on our hands. Um, this is just a, a, a layout of some of the exposures that we had. You've heard about all these before, so I'm not going to cover them, uh, except to say that um, uh, I firmly believe that uh, what the science is showing, that there's an association of Gulf War illness and the PB and uh, the, the pyristigmine bromide pills and the pesticides. I also believe that there are subcomponents of us that have issues from all of these other, uh, all of these other uh, uh, issues as well, including uh, a minority like me who have um, uh, uh, chemical warfare agent exposures. Uh, sand flies, fleas, and other insects were a major issue that led to pesticide use. And I don't know if you're able to see on this, um, uh, on, on the yellow can, I happened to find this photo online and I was just, I mean, it's the can that we would have used. And it was stunning to, when you read, outer non-combat military clothing and mosquito netting treatment only. We use these as bug bombs in our rooms uh, when we were stationed in buildings or in tents. We use them on our uniforms and when things got bad enough, we use them on our skin. Uh, the, the little piece on the left side, on the left side is the, uh, the pyristigmine bromide uh, pills that we took. Kamasi, you'd heard about um, earlier, where at least 100,000 were exposed to sarin and cyclosarin. Also, uh, most likely chemical warfare agents, I'm sorry, uh, mustard uh, gas, uh, which this map uh, shows the bunker complex. And this is, uh, uh, having set up this website, 91outcomes.com, that I, I write for now for fellow Gulf War veterans, just putting out health information because the VA was do doing such a bad job of it. Uh, previously, um, I've had veterans send me things. So this is a, uh, sent from a, a friend, a Gulf War veteran friend, Jack Morgan, who sent pictures, and this is what the demolition looked like at Kamasia. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a, a Humvee, and you can see the troops standing on top of the Humvee. And if I was able to zoom in, you'd see that they're not wearing any kind of protective gear whatsoever. And uh, uh, Jack has shared with me that there were no alarms set up. The war was over, and we had all been assured that there were no chemical warfare agents ever even deployed in theater. Therefore, we had no worries about anything. We, um, and to, in, in fact, at the end, in the closing weeks of the war, we simply, in my group, stopped using our alarms because there was no point in using them anymore because the Iraqis, we had been assured by DOD and CIA uh, intelligence, had never forward deployed chemical warfare agents, which we now know to be false. Depleted uranium, um, uh, the effects, uh, while many veterans are very concerned about these issues, uh, uh, science is at least suggesting that the long-term effects, uh, that the effects of depleted uranium are likely long-term, uh, may result in uh, cancers, particularly from inhaled and in, uh, uh, ingested depleted uranium dust. There is still some controversy and discussion, uh, discussion about whether inhaled or ingested depleted uranium can cause immediate and long-term uh, acute uh, chronic multi-symptom illness. In World War I, uh, there were a lot of lessons learned about chemical warfare agents. They even had this wonderful sniff kit uh, where you could smell different things, and so you could smell mustard gas and smell what it smelled like. Uh, it wasn't obviously real mustard gas. You could smell lewisite and smell it smelled like geraniums. And they even had these, uh, in World War I and World War II, they had these wonderful posters. Lewisite, smells like geraniums. Uh, mustard gas, smells like garlic or horseradish or uh, mustard. Phosgene smells like green corn or um, um, uh, even musty hay, you know, and if we had known these kind of things, but we Gulf War troops were so badly trained that I don't know, maybe some folks knew this, but I haven't spoken with a Gulf War veteran who knew any of these characteristic odors. I just happen to remember the smell of geraniums because it was something that my grandmother grew in her garden and just had all over her garden. I'd grown up with these. She had them every year. And in fact, it struck me so much that I shared with my family a few weeks later on a phone call about the smell, and I even... Uh, uh, before leaving, we uh, were stationed for uh, rest and recreation in, in, in Bahrain for ab about three days. And I went through a perfume shop asking and smelling all the different perfumes, trying to find this perfume because I believed it was, at the time, it was just a perfume that the Iraqis uh, troops had been wearing that just was so pungent, but it was, you know, it, it's, it's sad, but it was strangely beautiful uh, as well. And perhaps if we had had some of the training and the lessons we had learned from World War I but lost along the way, perhaps things might have been different for some of us. We had highly erratic and disturbed sleep, as you can see from Gulf War troops sleeping on the ground next to their uh, armored personnel carrier. Um, open burning uh, and burn pits are not new. We've been hearing about burn pits from this war, just like PTSD after Vietnam was not new. We now know that it traces all the way back to 
uh, uh, reading, uh, reading Homer's, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure if it was the Iliad or the, uh, uh, whatever, it, one of the two um, of his um, uh, epics um, tells the story and it, uh, it's clear looking back now that we can see that uh, uh, PTSD has always existed um, after, after war. But burn pits, uh, the, picture on the, uh, um, the picture on this side is from the current Iraq war. Uh, the picture on the far side is another photo sent to me by an, uh, another Gulf War veteran friend, Tim Cornelison from Ohio. And uh, this was a pretty much of a daily occurrence. We were burning feces. Uh, as well using diesel fuel. You can see the diesel fuel cans in the background. Um, obviously that can't have been very good for us um, either. And at larger um, locations, we burned everything uh, imaginable. We had a lot of uh, justified frustration, anger, and impatience. Uh, the long list of symptoms which are popping in. I, I guess the point I'd like to just make about this, we've heard about these before, are that uh, they're frequently seen simultaneously, so it's not just that someone has a headache or someone has some dizziness, but that often Gulf War veterans like me have many or even all of these. Uh, I've been fortunate to have very few skin conditions, uh, but uh, many of my Gulf War veteran brothers and sisters have not been so fortunate. Uh, again, as I made, said earlier, what's surprising is not that one-fourth to one-third became ill, but that what is surprising is that not all became ill and disabled. Um, years were squandered with no treatment. Uh, first, we were told there was nothing wrong with us. Then there was what, what we Gulf War veterans nicknamed the three no's. That's off on the, on the side. There were no chemical, uh, the Pentagon said there were no Iraqi chemicals deployed in theater. In theater, therefore, there was no possible exposure, and therefore, there was no possible illness. So we had nothing to worry about. It was all in our heads. Or it was just stress, or it was the same as after every war, or there's no unique illness. This is uh, from DOD's website, and I just checked, and it's still there from yesterday. And this is DOD um, uh, showing just how proud they are of uh, the, the research they did from 1994 to 2002. And you can see at the top of the list is stress ep epidemiology. And when you look at the rest of the list, uh, you see very little, if anything, that would have anything to do with our exposures and our uh, 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 treatments. DOD's efforts remain misguided focusing on issues that uh, um, uh, had remained misguided until the direction, until the development of the CDMRP. This is just a very quickly, as well, Paula talked about undiagnosed illness claims. Again, this is from the most recent uh, data that we had from 2007. Shows how many Gulf War veterans and how many undiagnosed illness claims were actually granted. Uh, obviously, that's a pretty pitiful number. Um, one of the things I shared with Congress is that being seen at the VA is not the same thing as being treated. Uh, I think uh, Dr. White referred to it very nicely as palliative care versus actually finding a cure. And now I just want to very quickly cover some of the things in our advocacy movement of what worked and what didn't. First, what worked was that we had mentors and models. We had Vietnam vets before us who had been abandoned by previous generations of veterans who didn't have to, they were so large, if you can imagine 16 million World War II veterans, 697,000 Gulf War veterans. Very different uh, numbers uh, after World War II. Um, the fight was much easier because almost every male was a veteran, so it was a much easier, uh, a much easier fight. No, almost no family was left untouched after World War II. Vietnam was a very different story. Um, Agent Orange legislation, we were able to model after, as Paul shared with you in, in much more detail, that led to uh, the IOM process, research and presumptives. Um, Persian Gulf War Vets Act of 1998 was modeled after Agent Orange legislation and shared with us by our Vietnam veteran mentors. Uh, the RAC succeeded in tapping into uh, the congressionally directed medical research program just a few years ago for uh, other medical, uh, that's been successfully used for military medical research in other areas. And it's now focused exclusively on finding treatments for Gulf War veterans. And then as well, now that we're talking and we have an open dialogue with the leadership of the current VA, uh, we're trying to model after other successful uh, uh, models for PTSD and TBI that are being used as well. Some of the things that worked as well were that we had, uh, we became a successful social movement. At the top you can see that first leaders emerged and organized along with groups, sort of building a base for social movement. This is, this is not any kind of tested sociological theory, this is me, so just to clarify there as well. Uh, our movements then gained public support through mass media. The mass media and public support led to momentum for our legislation. The legislation was implemented but the legislation continually failed to meet the expectations, which then led to the cycle uh, continuing. The picture off uh, on the side is a picture at the National Press Club 
uh, where on uh, the, re the RAC report was released in 2008, and we Gulf War veterans organized a press conference and, uh, at the National Press Club and had uh, uh, great successes there. Paul working the media as well, doing a lot of great things, and it really helped it to, to get the word out. Here's some things that didn't work. We had a naive assumption that perfect legislation, the legislation, the language was just perfect, it was everything we wanted, it would therefore result in the desired outcomes. That is not how things work in Washington, as we have learned. Uh, we had the naive assumption that the Persian Gulf War Vets Act of 1998 was all that was needed and that everyone could stop being advocates and simply move on to the rest of their lives. And several of us have tried to do that from time to time and, have, and keep getting pulled back into the fight. Uh, we had a naive, a naive assumption that when we finally convinced Congress that VA wasn't doing things right and we convinced them to allocate $75 million to uh, Dr. Robert Haley at the U University of Texas Southwestern, that that set aside would be honored by the VA. That contract was canceled and we've had a fight and we, uh, at this point we're, uh, unless Paul tells me otherwise, I don't see that we're winning that fight right now, unfortunately. What else didn't work at the VA? We had the mistaken belief that VA would automatically implement the 1998 legislation that created the RAC. Took years to do that uh, and lots of pressure from, uh, from inside the system. We also had mistaken beliefs that perfected undiagnosed illness legislation would re lead to a claims approval process for chronic Gulf War illness, multi-symptom illness that, as you saw from the claim num claims numbers earlier, with only just over 3,000 uh, undiagnosed illness claims being approved. What else worked was change from the inside. Some of us advocates gradually moved to the inside into key political roles, VA staff positions like Paul, congressional staff roles like myself and others, key roles within the veteran service organizations, state departments of veterans affairs where I served as an executive for six years in Wisconsin, one of the largest state DVAs. That led to increased knowledge, skills, and abilities, increased contacts, colleagues, and credibility. And that finally led to even greater power to effect or even in some cases direct change from the inside. What also works is the medical home concept. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about that except for the fact that that's a, obviously it's a new move, a newer movement. People in this room, I'm sure, are far more experienced in that area, but that um, um, certainly has, uh, is, is helpful as well. Most important of all, uh, what has worked is full and equal participation in all aspects of research, of policy, of programmatic development, implementation, oversight by members of the affected health population. I can't tell you how many times that I've met scientists who've been working on Gulf War illness issues and really hadn't uh, met the Gulf War veterans. What's working now is the CDMRP, the RAC, the task force. It's a picture of Bobby White. Um, I don't know if you've seen this picture, Bobby, but this was you um, uh, actually on the, when the report was delivered on that day in 2008. I'll, I'll be sure to get you a, a copy too. I should have done that before. And then persisting challenges. We continue to have credibility issues, although those are diminishing. We have persisting uh, issues as well with just simply the fact that our organizations have never been strong. We were never like the VFW, the American Legion after, after World War II. Um, our, organ our generation were not joiners and the organizations were not as welcoming as they could have been. We found great welcoming arms with Vietnam vets, but uh, uh, we've had lots of issues and challenges there. And you can see, I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but it's just some of the other issues that we have. And then the last one, of course, is that ill people don't always make the best advocates when they're having health issues. Some persisting challenges, we continue to have congressional competition for funding and for legislation. Uh, we continue to deal with uh, other forces. This was a quote that came from the USA Today and I found it interesting yesterday. It was in an article about TBI. And I, I think it uh, really highlights one of the issues that we deal with in the Department of Defense is you want to look out for the welfare of your men and women at the same time you win, want to win the fight. Sometimes these two things are, diamet are diametrically opposed. And one of the reasons why DOD and VA have been and forever always should be separate. Uh, unfortunately, one of the challenges as well has been, as I, I should have mentioned in greater detail, but was VA's excessive reliance on DOD rather than listening to veterans. And so that's been an incredible challenge for all of us uh, as well. Veterans testifying to Congress, telling all the things that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, some of the future directions, uh, CDMRP is moving forward. That's very positive, however, the challenge is that um, while the House has listened to us very well and has put in uh, $25 million this year, the Senate funding is only at $8 million. That only buys a few studies. I hear from our scientist colleagues that what's needed is a Manhattan Project level program uh, or something on the level of what uh, PTSD and TBI have been funded at, where in one year they got $300 million in funding for, for, for those, uh, those issues. 
Another issue is that, um, a, a positive issue is that VA, after forming this committee, has completely rewritten its request for proposals, making sure they no longer allow stress studies, uh, and uh, making sure that it's, um, uh, that, uh, and there's some challenges with them as well, and that they only focus on VA researchers. This is only just this year, so we're talking 19 years after the war. It's wonderful to see that progress, but again, it's, uh, uh, we're happy that it's better late than never. Uh, another positive uh, issue is that the Gulf War Task Force is led by the top leader inside, uh, inside VA. A handful of us had a chance to meet with him uh, in person when he asked us what we should do after the 2008 report. And uh, having uh, been a leader in a state veterans agency, one, again, one of the largest state veterans agencies in the country, I shared with him my experience for what it's like, what it's like to, to help to try and lead a bureaucracy with silos and institutionalized issues and suggested this is something you need to chair personally and here's all the folks you need to have on this task force. With pressure coming from Paul Sullivan's group and others, uh, we saw the task force uh, implemented. Uh, in fact, it was implemented before it was even announced, which was uh, a, a very nice change. Another is that uh, uh, legislation just signed into law by the president a few weeks ago is finally going to require the CIA to declassify Gulf War chemical exposure records. Um, we have a track record on how well that le you know, legislation that's passed, how well it's enacted. Uh, I have a number of recommendations that I'm just not going to cover in, in, in detail because just for the sake of, of time. Um, and I'll just conclude with a comment by uh, the RAC's chair, Jim Binns. 20 years into this battle, the objective is finally in sight. It's time for leaders and resources adequate to accomplish the mission. It's within reach. And it's a matter of choice. And with that, thank you very much for your attention and uh, pleased to be here. Thank you.